And good morning. Welcome to this edition of The Kitchen's Table. It must be a Tuesday morning because here we are in your ear and on, in your face to talk to you about wonderful things that are going on in the world today. I'm Earl Kitchings. Joining me, my co-host, Ron Lee Kennedy, here on Awesome Radio, WBISLP 106.9 FM. You can also catch the show on Facebook Live, YouTube, Roku, and GPAC 23. Miss Kennedy, good morning. Good morning. All right. So today uh, is the seventh day of the month of March, and ironically enough, right behind Black History Month comes Women's History Month. And today we're going to be talking about some very special women who have made their marks and continue to make their marks here in the history of the country and throughout the world. And we are just so excited to do this today because Ron Lean has some very, very special information she's going to be sharing with us today. And it's going to I won't say it, but it's going to surprise some people. <laughs> it's going to surprise some people. But, oh, uh, Ronnie, do, do you happen to know when they started doing Women's History Month? Actually, I wanted to look that up, but it hadn't, it hasn't been long. It hasn't been long. I see. But I am so glad that, you know, it's happening. Um, the many, milestones that has happened throughout women's history and we've been making history for quite a long time and that trend of making history continues even to this day because even as we speak women are making history uh, not only here in america uh, not around the world but in the smallest places in this country to the biggest places in this country, women are making history. And when we talk about not only women, but especially black women putting in their share to make a difference, to be a game changer, to do something to affect a better quality of life. Uh, and I think that's what we're all striving for uh, is a better quality of life so that we all can live in such a way not to uh, overrun anybody or displace anyone or to make anyone feel minimized or marginalized, but everyone just wants their opportunity to have their space and do uh, what they can do to have a good life and to make a contribution to life when and if possible. So it's uh, going to be interesting uh, on the shows this this month as we go forward with talking about women who have made a difference, women who are game changers. And uh, I, I think before I, I let Ronlene get started, I think uh, it's, it's interesting that one of the biggest game changers that happened, happened uh, almost two years ago when a black woman was put in office as the vice president of the United States of America and uh, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, had made her mark known prior to becoming the vice president. She was a very tenacious uh, district attorney out in the California area you know, of North California. Uh, she had come to Congress as the senator from North, from California and made herself known. And as as nice as she looks sometimes, Ron Lee, she is a no-nonsense person. Yes, I agree with that. And when she was at the young man's, um, when they were laying him to rest, uh, what is his name? Tyree, Tyree Nichols. Yeah, Tyree Nichols. I just happened to catch that segment when Reverend Al Sharpton was bringing her to the podium to speak. And... You're talking about innovators and game changers. I saw that all into her interaction as she was sitting with the family and as she was on the floor making her stance known, you know, about all of this nonsense and violence that, you know, that's had out here today. And I just can't wait to see what she's going to do next um, in 
you know, and the beautiful work that she has done out there in California and to be able to bring that, you know, to where in it is effective throughout the United States, you know, so that people continue to follow her. And as you said about Ben Crump a few weeks ago, you know, hey, I have my great nieces saying, you know, I want to be able to follow into the footsteps of Kamala Harris, but not as vice president, but as president of the United States. So that's the things that she's looking forward to. She believes wholeheartedly in Kamala Harris that she wants to do the right thing for the country and she wants to do the right thing for women. And it's not just women of color, but all women. So with that said, I think that's a good role model to emulate. I think what she is doing is, you know, spot on for what we need in this presence today. Well, that is so true. And as you were saying that, it made me think about the fact that there are so many women uh, and, and women of color who are now impacting the broadcasting business, who are journalists, uh, who have their own shows, who are uh, reporting the news, who are anchoring uh, news at both the national and local levels. Uh, they are just continually, you know, beating on that old guard of, you know, it's only for men and, and knocking those things out the way and making their talents, because that's what we really have to focus in on. Not so much that they are women, but they are people who are talented to get the job done. And it doesn't hurt that they are women, uh, especially when we talk about the ones who are reporting the news, because the news is so diverse in this day and time, uh, and it does need sometimes a lighter touch that uh, some women reporters can give. But when you look at the way a lot of them are doing their jobs, uh, it is uh, so, so impactful. Uh, for me, one of the finest journalists that I can think of in this day and time who has who does such an excellent job and who does a, a wonderful job in uh, covering news stories is Rachel Maddow. Uh, this woman is so phenomenal in bringing about information to the forefront that needs to be brought to the forefront about what's going on around the country and the issues surrounding the issues. So uh, uh, it's going to be an interesting month. So without Saying much more about that, I'm going to let Ron Lean bring us our women uh, for this first week of Women's History Month and let her talk about the women that she's thought deserve recognition. Ron Lean. Well, thank you so much. And before we get started with where I wanted to go, um, I wanted to recognize, start out recognizing the women of North Carolina since this is where we are streaming from. But I wanted to give way to who you brought to me today, um, Mr. Kitchings, and that is Ms. Bernadette Carrie Smith. So we talked about the Essence Magazine, um, uh, I think it was last week or a week before, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I found out that she was one of the people that was in the first issue of the, uh, well, was doing that um, prior to her being replaced by Mr. Lewis. But the idea that when it was Sapphire before the, uh, the um, before it changed to Essence, the idea that she was on the ground floor of the start of the Essence magazine, um, she came from the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, and then to be there before she went on to Vogue. So with that um, being the coming during that time, being an African-American woman uh, during that time that she came on, I don't believe, you know, women of color were allowed to vote yet. 
so to come through that era and then um, when I read about her relationship with um, David Frost, you know, to have to be um, not only African American, but to end up in a inter relation or interracial relationship during the 1960s, you know, that to me, uh, you're talking about milestones and knocking things down. That's what that woman did. And I just learned about her death. I will be reporting about her more in the next coming weeks because I do think that she deserves more than just a few seconds of the time. So um, I wanted to acknowledge her and all of the ladies that came first in, like you said, journalism, um, those things. So now let's start recognizing North Carolina. But before I go there, do you have anything you want to say about Miss Smith? No, I, th I think you summed it up. I think it was, uh, again, wonderful that a, a magazine for Black women came on the scene when it did. And I think for as long as it's been around, it's been uh, superb. That's the only word I can describe. So that's all I have. Okay, thank you. All right. So. I want to recognize this lady came out of North Carolina. Her name was Sally B. Howard. And there was a Dr. How there was a Dr. Woodard that she met later on in North Carolina um, to wherein they were able to found a school um, and a youth it had started out as a youth program. And it was the first, and it became Miss um, Woodard decided in honor of Sally B. Howard to start that first charter school in North Carolina, in Wilson, North Carolina. And it was a school about education, for education. And I wanted to talk about Miss um, Sally B. Howard for a minute. So Miss Howard, she came through a time um, as being the first African-American um, that started this, started a youth program. And it's because, you know, she went abroad um, out there in New Jersey or New York and she studied um, drama. She studied um, the arts with um, Harry Belafonte. She, um, and a few more others during that time. So we're talking about the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s during that era when things were unheard of as far as women wanting to put that best foot forward and to use their mind for the things that they were using their minds for. And that is to climb the ladder that is to make sure that the children are educated and that they can move on, not just in ground entry level jobs, but to go on and get higher education. And that's what this woman did. And when she came to North Carolina with her husband and they started these programs, you know, they, um, she opened up a youth camp and it was only for eight weeks. And those numbers were growing. Everybody wanted to send their children there because they were learning so much. And I just wanted to um, just really get into that part of it for her. But when I think about the number of schools and educators today, Earl, and I think about you know some of the things that you have said along the way in this journey that we have embarked on together. I really feel that the root of education for the children to be able to become productive adults that the teachers do not get their just due. You know, they don't get it in their salaries. They don't get it in recognition. There's so many things that they are, are missing. So 
Pearl today because education is being attacked. Share your sentiments on what education really should look like in the eyes of the, the parents whose children are benefiting from the education um, that the children are receiving, and then for them to go on and be productive citizens. Well, I would first say that when the question is asked what it should look like for the parents, what it should look like is such a broad, broad piece to, to talk about because we have so many different cultures and people embrace things differently, either based on their upbringing, based on their culture, uh, some of them based on re their religion. But to give as go good of an answer as I can to your question, I think education in 2023 should be very truthful. It should be very factual. It should be as diverse and inclusive as possible to make sure that everyone who has uh, made from a historical standpoint is recognized for what they have achieved and accomplished. We should also make sure that in providing education to our children in this day and time, that we utilize the best methods for teaching children so that it won't be an experience that they really don't enjoy. And, and that can be difficult because uh, the first thing that has to happen in any classroom, especially in the early years of children's lives, there has to be discipline. And when the discipline is not where it needs to be, and when I mean discipline, I'm just talking about children being attentive without providing too many distractions. Okay. Children will be children, however, they are there. When you go to school, as I share with children, their job is to learn. But it's difficult when you wanna learn and there are distractions that the teacher has to deal with. So uh, that aspect is something that has to, to come from home. But uh, the other part is that whatever the children learn in school uh, has to be uh, reinforced by parents and family members when they come home so that the understanding of what they are learning in school uh, can be totally understood and they can make sure they extract those things that are necessary. So going forward, our education for our children must be uh, very critical in its teaching methods, its teaching uh, facts, its teaching truths, uh, and its teaching honesty about what is and what is not. And as long as we vary way off from uh, truth and facts, it makes it difficult to, to teach children because children are like sponges and they will absorb whatever you give them, good or bad, they're going to absorb it. And they need to absorb more good and right than not. And uh, parents have to do their part. And when, when it all lines up, and as they say, in a perfect world, when it all lines up, uh, we can have a very dynamic country and a very dynamic educational system. That is absolutely correct. You know, you made me think about where we are now. And I don't want to take away from, you know, the Women's History Month. However, I do think right now we have elections going on 
And we need to be mindful of who we're putting in for our Board of Education um, in our state and superintendents and things like that, because all of that, it matters. It all matters of who gets to say what over our children. And then it goes back to us as parents and grandparents. We need to reserve at least an hour or hour and a half out of our day with our children to find out what are they learning in school? Are they truly learning? And are there any barriers that need to be um, met to, for them to overcome whatever those challenges are so that they can get the kind of help that they need in order to be able to learn and to be able to enjoy learning. And this is what I understood about um, Sally B. Howard is that she made learning fun and she encouraged them to learn and learn more. And so I'm so glad for Dr. Joanne Woodard who is, um, who carried the baton forward. Um, Sally B. Howard is deceased now, but um, Ms. Dr. Woodard is definitely carrying that baton. And I pray that the schools and everything that she touches, that it will still go on in excellence, whoever that baton is passed to. So thank you so much, um, Earl, for sharing. Well, when we talk about individuals who make a contribution, contributions uh, should not be taken lightly. Um, and, and the reason why I say that is because contributions align with sacrifice. Uh, when you sacrifice uh, time, talent, resources, it requires uh, a lot of thinking about how you want to do it, why you want to do it, what you want to do with it, how much you might want to give. And when individuals are taking time, because time is not so easily to be replaced. It's not a uh, easy, renewable resource. And when people are giving of their time, especially from a volunteer standpoint, we must realize that they do that for a few reasons, uh, primarily because they have a desire and a passion to impact uh, a situation or to make a difference uh, in what's going on in the lives of people. And for these two women to focus in on education and want to make the education realm a lot more impactful and to start and to carry it forward. Uh, as you were talking about the education part, it made me think about Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, who started a school for girls who merged it with a school that was a school for boys. And that's how we be, we got Bethune-Cookman uh, because uh, Darnell Cookman was a, a boys uh, school, uh, Cookman Institute. And uh, so the two of them came together. Think about that. Here's a black man and a black woman uh, deciding that, hey, let's come together and make this work and make a very strong opportunity for children of color. So henceforth became Bethune Cookman University, but Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune started that college with very meager earnings, uh, didn't have a lot that started on a, on a junkyard. That's where it actually started. But she had a vision. She mm -hmm. stuck to her vision. Yeah. She stuck to what she knew was necessary in order to make that situation work and she continued to just drive herself to make all those things happen because it was important and because of that we have what we have so when uh you know the women that you're speaking of did ideally the same thing it, it makes such a big difference and hopefully the quality of education uh, helps with the quality of life and the quality of life continues to nurture others to continue to invest in that pool. 
Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I was so proud um, just to be talking about this. I remembered when I was in college and I did a paper and it was talking about uh, we had to do one about the most influential people in our lives. And so I decided to do one on my mother because she was the, um, for me, made me think about things in, in, in ways that I had not thought about them before. And anyone who can make you think on such of a deep level, you know, it is, um, it's a time to, how would I want to say that? To be humble um, about the beginnings that you have and never to forget them. So I'm so grateful um, to be able to talk about this today on the level that we are. So I'm going to um, give way now to let you go to, you know, to do our station identification, and then we're going to bring in our next person. Thank you. We are here with the Kitchen's Table every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. on WBIS LP 106.9. Awesome radio. Always glad to be with you. Check us out on YouTube, Facebook Live, Roku, and GPAC 23. Every Tuesday morning, catch the Kitchen's Table here with Earl Kitchens and Ronnie Kennedy for news, information, thought-provoking ideas, and other things that come to our minds to share them with you. And we hope that we bring you things that cause you to give consideration, give you pause to uh, look into it, or at least appreciate the fact that it may be something you did not know. And we bring you something that maybe influences how your day might go, or you can share it with someone else and say, ask them, did you know? And that's one of, one of the things we, that we pride ourselves in is bringing information that maybe you did not know or think about. So uh, we're here doing Women's History Month on this seventh day of March. And we've done half of the first week of that with uh what was the, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, you got Dr. Woodard's name in my in my head right now, but that's not the lady that you started speaking of. Yes, Sally B. Howard. Miss Howard, Miss Howard, yes. I'm going to call her Dr. Howard. Okay. I'm going to call her Dr. <laughs> Howard since she's she started this school. So between Dr. Howard and, and Dr. Woodard, uh, yes, we're, we're happy to have that information. So we're going to keep moving forward because um, before we close, I do have my little nugget of North Carolina women's history that I want to bring to us before we close out the show today. But Marlene, who's our next person for Women's History Month? Our next person is no other than Akila Thigpen. Who? Uh, Akila? Uh, this is Akila <laughs> Thigpen. <laughs> yes. So... Oh, there's so much I could say about this lady. Um, she is um, the station owner of WBIS Awesome Radio. And when, when we've had extensive talks, I met her in 2014. And at that time, you know, she was telling me about Vision on Films. That's one of her companies that she started. And then, of course, Awesome Radio. And at that time, Awesome Radio was just an online broadcasting um, show. And she had a vision. She had a vision for several things um, to put in order. And today she is the uh, general manager for GPAT TV out there in Pitt County. And now we um, she's going on to bigger things in the broadcasting industry of uh, with Awesome Radio. So I am just so happy about it. And as I was reading her story, her story was talking about how she was feeling in this industry, just thinking about the industry itself as she was completing her education and she was going through some things personally. And she realized that women needed a broader voice. 
And what better way to do that is for people to be able to tune in to the radio station, to be able to talk about the things that they were, the challenges that they had, if that's a better word, the challenges that they had and the things that they want to overcome. And she believed through the teachings of Jesus Christ that they could overcome just like she came um, overcame her challenges and things like that. So with that said, today, you know, as her ministry has expanded over not just the radio segment, but also television to wherein um, what needs to be said by women, men, the ministries, and um, she's, she's very supportive where the candidates are concerned for legislation, uh, the, the political arena all together. So I'm glad that she has given a voice. I'm glad she found a way to be able to make those voices impactful. Um, she's a great interviewer. So you could catch her out on um, with the Ruku TV that she has, the, those stations, and also um, Facebook Live for Awesome Radio and for GPAT. And Mr. Kitchens, I, I, Earl, I just wanted to tell you that when she extended um, my voice, you know, that the made that invitation to me. And you and I, we would talk every now and then, and we met through Toastmasters and the things that you would get on that in that platform and, and talk about, you know, made me think even more about what I can do, um, understanding the different conditions that needed to be addressed out here. And so this is why I extended the invitation to you to be able to come you know, live to be able to help people along the way. And I tell you what, based on the feedback that I get um, here and there, you have been that impactful person. So thank you. Well, thank you, Ronlene, for those kind of sentiments of uh, the fact that a person of the quality and caliber of a, a, an Aquila Thigpen is on this fast track meteor to rising in the media industry. And I said meteor, not media, but a, on a meteor to rise fast in this media industry is a very remarkable thing because through you, I've met uh, Akila and we've spoken about what her vision is and her ideas are and the projects that she would like to embark upon. I told her she was a sleeping giant in the media business. She is at the ground level now building her foundation for her media enterprise, her media conglomerate. I see a lot of outstanding things happening for her. I see a lot of projects spinning out of what she's doing. And it's just a matter of time before these things happen. Uh, in talking with her and understanding how she launched her media business, primarily with her radio station, it's just been remarkable that she's had the focus and the passion to be consistent in doing what she's doing day in, day out. She is uh, the North Carolina version, in my opinion, of Kathy Hughes. Kathy Hughes, uh, owner, vice president, uh, pre president, excuse me, owner, president of TV one and, and radio one. And I believe that Akila is on that same track. It's just a matter of time. Now I, I, I bet you this, I bet you if someone dropped a few million dollars in Akila thick pins lap today, <laughs> today, you would see her take what she's doing to another level because it would give her what she needs, the resources that she needs to invest and open up more of her projects and grow her business from a logistical standpoint, because the media industry is not a cheap industry to undertake. Uh, equipment is needed. 
equipment is expensive. Uh, you also have to have people. And, and that's one of the things that uh, we seem to underplay sometimes as a business owner sometimes that we want to wear too many hats and you need people, but you can't have people if you don't have the resources to compensate them. So you have to wear all these hats, but I'm sure if she had what she needed, as they say, what do you need? And if you could have everything you needed, where would you be? If she had everything she needed in this day and time today, you would see her business grow exponentially to the point where her vision would come to life. And she would be that new media mogul on the rise and giving other people opportunities as she's giving me and you opportunities to bring forth uh, information. And we've also talked about some future projects. So I'm thankful that you knew Akila and that Akila again, provide an opportunity and we don't want to misuse the opportunity. We want to maximize on that, but she is a phenomenal woman and I'm just happy that she's been blessed to have this opportunity to have a radio station and some other media entities that she is working so passionately to grow that in years to come, we're going to hear about her at a new level because she is definitely on the rise. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. I remember the late nights that we um, talked about her vision and carrying it forward and being able to pass that torch along to people in her family, you know, to be able to come right behind her and carry that baton on. So I'm just looking, like you said, it, it takes money in this industry. It takes money in any, any industry, but it definitely takes money in this industry to stay competitive and to be able to have the things that you need in order to um, stay up with the trends, to be able to attract um, more people, um, talents and things like that. And also the projects that she wants to put in place to be able to help the ch to bring children into this um, industry on a greater level. So I am looking forward to the things that she wants to do to be able to come into fruition. And I thank you, Earl, for just bringing all of that out um, today. Well, I, I also think that with her media enterprise and because <clears throat> she's wanting to bring uh, youth into this enterprise that I can see where, because there are at least seven black colleges in North Carolina, I can see them partnering with her so that their students can utilize her enterprises as internships to help them become men and women in the media business. And I'm and, and saying that, Ronlene, uh, recently, this is going to probably blow you away, uh, in looking at some video clips on Twitter, there is, and I, I wish I could think of his name right now, but there's a little boy who's about 11 years old. He's no older than 11. And recently, they showed clips of him interviewing college and professional football players for his, I won't say it's a TV show, but just the process of him interviewing them for whatever he's using that for. He is so professional. He is so knowledgeable. He is so polished at this age because he's not intimidated by what he's doing. He's not afraid to go ask questions to adults the way he does. He is ready for prime time right now. And one of the things that I put out about him doing this is he 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 has this he has this little small like small microphone and I'm like it we need to get him a bigger microphone so he can look the part because he dresses up in a shirt and tie, he asks his very poignant questions and I think if he got 
the equipment he needed to make him his presence a little bit uh, more impactful. Uh, I think he would even feel a lot more polished because now he's using that same equipment. He watches the professionals on TV use. So uh, I haven't gotten any responses back. I don't know how to get in touch with him or his parents to maybe provide him with the funding. But if you can find somebody that young wanting to be in the media business, and he said this is all he wants to do. He just wants to be this TV reporter, this TV personality. He has already got a jump start on where he's going. And when I'm, I'm going to bring his name to the show next week. But 10 years from now, 15 years from now, I guarantee you, I guarantee that he will be this phenomenon. He will be this phenomenon that we spoke about in 2023 and say, man, I remember talking about that young man back in 2023 and look at him now because he is going to be that next superstar in the industry uh, as it relates to uh, definitely sports. So uh, Akilah, I'm just letting you know, it's, it's, it's some young some young superstars out there and they're just waiting to join and connect with someone like yourself to nurture them and move them forward and they become those superstars of tomorrow. All right. So, yes. So, is it Jeremiah Finham? Jeremiah, that might be his name. Okay. I have I have to go back and look on my on on my on my um, Twitter account just to see because every time I see him and they 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 put his footage out there, I'm just awestruck by the fact that this young man, I'm going to say young man, but this little boy is so polished. It's unbelievable. You you won't believe how polished he is when he's standing there asking these guys questions. And like I said, the only distraction for me is the fact that someone has not realized that he doesn't need a little four inch microphone to do these interviews. You need to get him a real microphone and, and get him accustomed to holding that kind of microphone so that he can interview um, the players that he interviews, because in a sense that trivializes him because the equipment looks like children's equipment and you may not take him serious, but if he comes up there with a real microphone and has the, the flag banner that goes around that microphone and he walks up to you with that in his hand and you know, you're like, Oh, this is a <laughs> real reporter. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to, see, you know, you, you see, you see a child, but, you know, when the equipment matches the child, it's like it, you, you you keep him at that level. But if I give you the right equipment and you bring it to me, I'm going to treat it differently. So that's why I was looking at it from that perspective, because that's that's really all he needs uh, to move himself forward. Uh, I can see that if he got the right camera to do the work, that that would be a plus for him. I, I just would like to empower him as much as possible uh, so that he can have what he needs so that he can do what he needs to do, because I would not have a problem hiring him right now to be a reporter, to go out and and get some stories or at least do some interviews with some people, because he has no fear of the camera and what he's supposed to do. He embraces it. He wants to do it. The more you give him, the hungrier he's going to be and the more he's going to become more polished. And I can just see him in somebody's school of journalism and just knocking it out the park all the time. And then, you know, you have someone like that, they can call the shots as to where they're going to work and how much they're going to get paid because you want them to be on your payroll. So I'm looking forward to it. But I'm going to double check that name. You said Jeremiah. Jeremiah Fennel. That's what I came up Fennel. with. Okay. I'm going to check that because if that's who it is, I'm just wanting to get in touch with his parents uh, to go through them to find out uh, if they would be okay with him being gifted some better equipment because I know that aside from what I saw him doing, he probably, you know, finds something to interview or people to talk to or always just working on his craft every day because he's driven. So I'm going to I'm follow up with that. And uh, if that's who it is, I'm going to find a way to try to get in touch with his parents to see how we can make a difference. You, you want to talk about a game changer? That's who he is. 
Oh, okay, and that, that sounds like a great project for the mentors program. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our next thing, um, you asked about when did women's history start? So mm -hmm. when I was uh, researching um, Mr. Fennel real quick, um, I came up with 1987 after okay. being petitioned by the National Women's History Project, Congress passed. Um, so March of um, 90, uh, 1987 is when um, women's history became real um, to wherein it is acknowledged that women do need to be, um, has earned that right to be recognized. Okay. And uh, you are right. That is the young man um, that I was speaking of, Jeremiah Fennell. Uh, I, I quickly looked him up and that's who it is. And now that you have uh, given me that information, I'm going to reach out and find uh, who I need to contact because like I said, what he needs is just a little bit more help and he will. And I, and I tell you, if you go and look at what he does on YouTube, you just go check him out and you tell me if he's not polished to be, 10, 11 years old, you tell me if he's not polished and compare it to some teenagers or some young up and coming journalists who are doing the same thing and just compare him to them and see if hmm, he's not too far behind. You know, he's not too far behind some students who are in college working on their journalism degrees. You know, uh, and you're right. And that reminded me of Rockman Johnson, my cousin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was coming up um, as he mentioned that I <laughs> washed his face or <laughs> whatever the case right. may be. You know, it's um, and look at him today. You know, just continuing to make his mark. So he still speaks well and um, has done a lot of things. Been on television, um, acting. You know, in major roles you know, on screen. So I, 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 you got me excited about Jeremiah Fennell today. Okay. All right. So the next person um, that I wanted to honor, and I thank you for bringing um, her to my attention, and that is the late Fanny Jackson Coplin. Um, she was born Coppin. in Coppin. I'm Coppin. sorry, Coppin. She was born in slavery. Her aunt purchased her freedom for $125 at the age of 12. She became an African-American teacher, it seems, before she entered college, and then was the first African-American female student to enter into Oakland um, College in Ohio. Um, she became principal for the Institute of Colored Youth now known as Cheney University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, um, Pennsylvania, and went on to become the first African-American school superintendent in the United States. And she also was invited to be the speaker at the World's Congress of Representative Women in Chicago and delivered a speech called Intellectual Progress of Colored Women of the United States since the Emancipation Proclamation. I would have loved to be there for that speech. And did you know anything about the World's Congress of Representative of Women in Chicago? Never heard of it. Never heard of it. And you know, when I thought about that, Earl, and I know it's time for us to wrap up, when I thought about that, it made me think about your aunt, the lady who you said was in the, um, in the Navy, as mm -hmm. an officer and mm -hmm. i want to i definitely want to find out more about that but before we close that i want to just um honor these ladies um besides her she was one of the five um that was invited um, by the world's congress of representative women in chicago and that would be um anna julia cooper sarah jane woodson early fanny barrier williams and Holly Brown. They were among the five um, African-American women that was invited to speak at this event. And I would also like to honor 
um, Mary Jane Patterson and Francis Josephine Norris for being amongst the graduating class to have graduated with their undergraduate degree during 1865, along with Fanny Jackson Copeland. Okay, so you, you forgot to tell everyone one important thing about Fanny Jackson Coppin. All right, tell it. So Fanny Jackson Coppin is who Coppin State University in Baltimore, Maryland is named after. Okay. Just so everyone knows, Coppin State University is named after Fanny Jackson Coppin. Okay, a black woman like Dr. Bethune. So we have two black colleges that we're aware of named after two black women. So there we have it. But Raleigh, thank you so much for bringing us all that information. That's going to do it for us today here on the Kitchens Table. Once again, we ask you that you join us every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. here on Awesome Radio, WBIS 106.9 FM, Awesome Radio. And if you'd like to catch out our show, catch our shows on Youku, on Roku, excuse me, Roku, Facebook Live, YouTube, and GPAC 23 for Ron Lee Kennedy. I'm Earl Kitching saying until next Tuesday morning, go out and do something good for somebody else. Take care.